It is indeed an honor to have the privilege of introducing my friend, Eldridge Cleaver. We've had the privilege of having Eldridge stay with us in our home. We have learned to know him, not only from his public image, but as a personal friend as well. And I'd like to share just a few things with you, not only about uh, the public image, but about the internal man. We're privileged to have with us his wife, uh, Kathleen, who was already introduced, but we did not meet his two children, and I think you'd like to know them. His 11-year-old son, Maceo, and his 10-year-old daughter, Joju. Would you stand, please? Maceo was born in Algeria, Joju in North Korea. And there are some very interesting stories there. Eldridge Cleaver is a man who has seen America from very different perspective than most of us. However, there are some similarities, too. He's a man who has a deep feeling for freedom and justice for all. And he has not accepted life in America for granted, but instead has chosen to challenge it at every turn. He was a top leader in the Black Panthers and became nationally notorious during that period of time, during the 60s, when America went through a great deal of unrest. During the times that he has fought for his freedom, he has been at times belligerent. He has insisted on fairness when he has seen injustice. He's fought fearlessly for what he believed to be right for his people as well as for himself, not only for the black people, but for American people as a whole. He's been in shootouts and other very dangerous situations. He's been wounded. He has spent considerable number of years in prison and has learned to survive with hardened criminals and yet used that time to good advantage to carefully study democracy as well as communism. Now, he studied these not only in books but firsthand, looking carefully at the circumstances. He has not just been a tourist abroad but has lived nearly eight years in foreign countries, including Cuba, Russia, Red China, North Vietnam, North Korea, Algeria, and France. And having studied firsthand, came to some very important conclusions, which he'll be telling us about tonight. Namely, he would rather live in America, as he put it, in prison, than to live in one of these other countries as a free citizen. Because he loves America, and he knows now the things for which he stands. He's made mistakes in his life, and he's the first to admit it. But he's profited by those mistakes. He is now truly an American not just by birth, but an American by choice, having returned to America facing criminal prosecution and yet willing to do that and has nearly now finished paying his indebtedness so that he can be free in the total sense of the word. He has deep roots in America. He's a direct descendant of Jefferson Davis. Contrary to what people may think, he has never been indicted for murder. In fact, Many of the things of which he's accused are simply not true. Now, aside from these kinds of things, you may want to know some other things. He loves gardening. He makes, not only does he love gardening, but makes flower pots out of stones and cement. He's a designer of clothing and uh, operated at one time in the Los Angeles area a clothing design and fabric shop and designed custom clothes for people. 
He has displayed his clothes and designer shows. He is a family man. He loves his family and spends a great deal of time with them. Uh, let me just mention one or two things about his family. Joju recently gave him a card addressed to the best daddy in the whole world. When he received it, received it, Eldridge said, really, the best daddy in the whole world? Joju said, well, at least the best daddy I know in the whole world. <laughs> he was at dinner at my brother's place a while back, and my brother's little boy uh, fell and, uh, while they were having dinner and uh, bumped himself in one of those little incidents that's very serious in the mind of the little tot. And you know what happens when a tot bumps himself? Crying, he headed right for his mommy and daddy, right? Wrong. He headed all the way around to the other side of the table to Eldridge for comfort. And Eldridge, not missing a beat, reached down, patted little Aaron, and soon had him feeling good again. Eldridge is a sensitive man, a man who thinks not just of himself but others. I've never been in his presence when he wasn't genuinely interested in knowing what I was doing and what things have been happening in my life. Last evening, there was a little incident that took place that I think typifies the kind of man he is. He was sitting in one of our fine Provo restaurants, and as he and I were sitting and talking, uh, he interrupted for just a moment and called the waitress over and said, Waitress, uh, excuse me, but you've served me something here I can't eat. And she said, Oh, really? What's that? He reached down into his soup with his spoon and pulled out the tin can lid. <laughs> And he was apologizing for saying anything about it. Well, this is the kind of man he is. He's intelligence, he's sensitive, he's feeling of all of those around him. And I think this is a side of him that not enough of us know. Truly, we are privileged this evening to have as our speaker Eldridge Cleaver. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my great pleasure and an honor to have been uh, selected to appear here tonight and to address you. I had the experience of coming into this great hall several months ago when I was here during the general conference and uh, participated in one of the priesthood sessions that were held here. At that time, I remember looking around and looking at all the people and just being amazed at such a huge hall and such a large number of people. And never did the thought come to my mind that someday I would be standing here speaking to an audience here tonight. So you have to forgive me if I'm a little nervous because this is indeed a sort of a frightening experience for me. I had forgotten about that uh, incident with the soup last night. <laughs> and I guess I might have been a little apologetic when I uh, told the waitress that I couldn't eat that tin top. But I guess a lot of you have had that same kind of experience and uh, these kinds of mishaps when you go out to a restaurant. So I just took it in stride. I didn't. I think it was part of my welcoming committee. <laughs> I want to thank the people who have been so kind to myself and to my family. We've had a wonderful experience being here, and my children in particular were very delighted at the uh, <clears throat> things that were arranged for them to have a lot of fun, and they actually don't even want to go back home. So it's been a, a good experience for all of us coming here to participate in this Freedom Festival. When I look back at my own life experience, 
I have to bow my head and thank God Almighty for preserving my life through many perilous situations that I've been involved in. But most of all, far beyond just having my life preserved, I'm thankful that I've had an experience that has enlightened me to the beauty and the greatness of the United States of America and its people. There was a time when I would not have been able to utter those words that I've just stated. For my heart became so full of bitterness and hatred and opposition to the United States of America that I lost all objectivity and had no understanding of the good that is in America and the good that America has meant to the whole world. And so it has been out of this bitter experience, out of a devotion to an ideology that intended and that had as its goal the elimination of the United States of America. It has been out of that bitterness and out of that background that I have come home to America and I have been reconciled to America. Now many people when they hear me say that they get angry with me because they say, does this mean that you're no longer interested in the plight of black people or other people who have special problems in the United States? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that I have had an experience that has shown me that there is no solution to the problems of black people, to the problems of other minority people, that does not take into consideration the overall picture of what's going on in the United States of America and in the world. We no longer can believe that it is possible to solve our individual problems or the problems of our particular group while ignoring the problems of the rest of the country. We are in one boat all together in a very stormy sea and we are going to sink or swim as a nation, as a people, as a civilization and I'm standing up with those people who want to see this great ship sail on to a brighter future and not sink and not go under at this point in time. So I'm standing up for America. And I'm very happy and very proud to have this opportunity to stand before you and to declare these things. Now, many people have read things about me and they say, oh, what a terrible guy this guy always was. <laughs> well, I must take this moment to point out to you that my mother tells me that up until the time that I was 12 years old, that I was a little angel. She says that when I became 12 years old, I became an unrighteous little devil. <laughs> well, when I inquired into my background as to what was going on at that time in my life, what caused the change? One lady said to me once after she heard me speak, she said, Eldridge, you didn't just turn 12 and sprout horns. Something had to be going on in your life to cause that great change to come about. And what it was, that my mother and father fell out with each other and started fighting with each other. I came from a home where there were six children in the family, starting way back there in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I was born. And I was born into a family where the ministry was a tradition amongst the men. Both my grandfathers were preachers. My mother's father was a Methodist preacher, and my father's father was a Baptist preacher. And that turned out to be a very unstable mix. <laughs> but it still provided a certain Christian context 
for our home life and for our upbringing. And my mother was always a very dedicated Christian woman. Anytime you would talk to my mother, she would always answer by quoting some scripture. And that was just the kind of woman she was. And it was she who spent time with her children, uh, insisting that they study the Bible and that they go to Sunday school and attend church services. And she was always insisting that we would pray before going to bed at night and that uh, we pay close attention to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, after we left Arkansas and went to live in Los Angeles, California, it was there that I turned 12 years old. And it was part of the arguments and fights that my mother was having with my father that caused my father one day to say, this was one Sunday morning, and my mother was preparing us to go off to Sunday school, and I was being a little reluctant. And my father said, I'm not going to force my children to go to church. I'm going to leave it up to them. If they choose not to go, then no one is going to make them go. And I chose at that moment not to go. And my other brothers and sisters went along with my mother, and I laughed at them as they went out the door. And I waited impatiently for them to come out of the church, which was not far from our house. And then I laughed at them again when they came out. Well, as I look back at the experience of my family, at my other brothers and sisters, I cannot help but think that actually I was laughing at myself. Because it was at that point that my life began to go off in another direction. None of my brothers and sisters ever had the kind of experience that I had of going in and out of jails and prisons. And so when I look back, I can see that that was a very drastic decision that was made in my life and one that I wish that I could undo because I am the one who turned out to be the white sheep of my, f I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, excuse me. I had meant to say the black sheep of my family. <laughs> and very soon, in that atmosphere of strife and conflict in my home, when my father would work all during the week in a very normal way, he'd go to work and come home and go to work. But every Saturday night, he would start a big fight with my mother. And all of the children used to square off and take my mother's side in these arguments and these fights. And I was a little guy at that time, and my father was about as tall and as big as I am now. And it became my driving ambition to grow up and get big the way that he was so that I can give him some of the medicine that he was giving us. And I determined in my heart that I would grow and get strong and get big and just someday just walk up to him and just knock him out. That was what I had in my heart. Well, my father left my mother with the six children in Los Angeles. He went to Chicago to live. And of course, when my father was removed from the picture, I didn't revert back to being a little angel. I continued down that path that my life had taken. And very soon, I started getting into trouble with the law. The first time that I was ever in trouble with the law, it was over some small incidents of vandalism that involved myself and my friends going to our little grammar school, breaking into the athletic department, tearing up everything, taking all of the footballs, basketballs, and baseballs. Then we went into the dining room and ate up all of the food that was prepared and edible. And fooling around with the gas range, we set the building on fire and ran out. Well, some of the people who lived near the school recognized who we were and called the police. And so, to my great astonishment, the police showed up at my door asking for me. And they took me to Juvenile Hall. And I stayed there for two hours. After that, my mother came down and they released me to her custody. Well, that was the first time that I was ever under any kind of arrest. The last time that I suffered a prison sentence, I stayed there for almost 10 years. 
so that you can see that between the two hours in custody and the 10 years in custody, there's a whole sordid record of violation of the penal code in the state of California. We used to call that the California merry-go-round. It was so easy to get on that merry-go-round, but it seemed impossible to get off of it. And what would happen, we would go into one of the institutions, and while we were there, we would uh, study other forms of criminality. We would learn new crimes to commit, or new ways of committing the old crimes, and then we would get out and try them out and get arrested again and go to the next institution up the ladder. It was really like being caught up in a parallel educational system. It was like graduating classes going up the ladder. <laughs> Some of the same people that I met the very first time that I went into juvenile hall were with me at every stage of the way. I ended up in Folsom Prison, which is the finishing school of the prison system in the state of California. And with me in Folsom Prison were some of the people that I met in Juvenile Hall the first time I went there for those two hours, which was the kindergarten of the prison system in the state of California. So then it was up the ladder, one step at a time, all the way to the end of the line. And while I was in prison, I began to take a look at myself. Because up until that time, I never did condemn any of my own behavior. I would always find ways to blame whatever I had done on someone else. I would blame social conditions. I would blame society. I would blame history. I would blame white people. I would always find some way to avoid looking at my own behavior and condemning myself. But during that last time that I was in prison, I had done things that I could not blame on someone else. And so this forced me to look at myself, to look at my behavior, and of course when I did that, I did not approve of what I saw, and I condemned myself. And I began then to try in some way to get a handle on my life. And I said to myself, I don't want to go back out of here and go back to a life of criminality. I want to get out of here and do something constructive. And so I began to study about society. I was very interested in the social sciences because I felt that there was the answer to my life, that if I would master this information, I would be able to understand the social process and then take some decisions that would remove my life and remove myself from the path that I had been following. Well. <clears throat> I was part of a group in prison that was called the Jailhouse Intellectuals. And people called us that because we preferred to spend our time studying and reading and trying to improve our minds. And I did this because I saw very clearly that when you go to prison, it's a losing proposition from every point of view. And that the only thing that you could possibly do that would be constructive in the long term is to improve your skills and to improve your mind. And so I followed that path. There were some people there who would spend all of their time playing marbles, for instance. And you go to Folsom Prison, you would be surprised to see some little old men down on their knees shooting marbles. And they become experts in shooting marbles. The only problem is once they get out of prison, they find that there's no market for expert marble players. And so what they do is revert back to their behavior, the things that they are familiar with, and they get arrested again and return to prison. Well, I felt that the best thing for me to do was to get a handle on some information and hopefully change my life in that manner. I became very preoccupied with what was going on outside of the prison in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And I began to feel that this is what was attracting me. This was the thing that I was interested in. And so I began consciously to develop the attitudes and to study the information that would prepare me to participate in this activity once I got out of prison. And so I did this. And the man who was in charge of our little study group in prison, uh, we all considered him to be the smartest man in prison. He was the one that used to tell us which books to read. If we had any questions, we could always ask him about it, and he could come up with the answer. He used to win all of the arguments, and so we thought that he was the smartest man in the whole prison. When I look back at that, 
I wonder why we thought that, because every time I went to jail, John was always there. <laughs> and he would be there when I left, and he would be there when I came back. And I'm telling you right now, he's in Folsom Prison, right now, this day. A very old man like me with not as much hair as we used to have. Well, John Hall was the one who introduced me to the Communist Manifesto. He had noticed my keen interest in social affairs, and he said one day, Eldridge, I think that you are now ready for the Communist Manifesto. And so he gave me a copy, and he spent a lot of time with me explaining what it was all about. He gave me a long list of books to read after I finished with the Communist Manifesto. And I can say that the library in San Quentin Prison in, in California was amply stocked with all of the books that were on this particular list. And if there were books that I was interested in that weren't in supply in the library, the officials were very happy to send to the state library and get a copy of whatever book it was and bring it in. And so I spent that whole period of my imprisonment studying the social process and finally specializing in communism and Marxism towards the day that I would get out of prison so that I could apply this. And the date for me was in December the 6th of 1966 uh, that I was released from prison and I took my parole to Northern California, to San Francisco, California, because that was where all of the anti-war activity and the black movement was very strong in Oakland, California. And so I went there with the intention of getting involved in these two activities and so to eke out my destiny and my future involved in this movement. And I very quickly made contact with the Black Panther Party once I got out of prison. At the time that I encountered them, the party was only two months old and it just had a handful of members. But I was fascinated by them as soon as I saw them and I joined up with them on the spot. And the thing that attracted me to them was the fact that it was an armed organization. The first members of the Black Panther Party that I ever saw walked into this meeting where I was and they had on these black uniforms, these black berets, and each one of them had a rifle, a shotgun, or a pistol strapped around their waist. And I went with them immediately. I hooked up with them. I became the Minister of Information of the organization. As such, I was in charge of the political education of the party. I was in charge of all of its written material, its newspaper and publications. And it was my task and my job to prepare these materials and approve them and so forth. Well, the Black Panther Party was a revolutionary organization. We adopted Marxism as our ideology and we had as our goal the overthrow of the American uh, government as it existed. We felt that it was impossible for black people to have a good life under the system as it existed. We felt that the capitalistic system was a rigged system and that the only way that our people could get in on the good life was to eliminate the capitalistic system, replace it with a system of communism that would confiscate all of the property, all of the goods from those who at that time possessed them, and then this property would be made into the common property of all. And this was a very appealing ideology to us, and so we adopted it and went after it with no reserve. Now, my association with the Black Panther Party started about two weeks after I got out of prison in 1966. And we began to really set Oakland on fire. We, we used to follow the police around when they would come into the community at night in automobiles. Sometimes we would have two or three cars full of men, all of them armed. And you have to understand that in California at that time, it was not illegal to possess rifles, shotguns, and pistols in the manner that we used them. The only laws on the books were fish and game laws that were aimed at hunters. And these laws stated that you could not come within the city limit 
with a rifle or a shotgun that had a live round of ammunition in the firing chamber. You could have the magazine full, you could have your pockets full, your hands full, bandoliers full. That was not illegal. And so we had instructions and advice from lawyers on how to handle these weapons in a legal manner. Many people think that everything that we did was totally illegal and that we were a criminal conspiracy from the very beginning. But I can just tell you that at the beginning of that process, none of us had any warrants out for our arrest. At the end of that process, we were all either in jail, in hiding, abroad in exile, or many of us were killed in the shooting confrontations that took place between us and the police departments. Well, in 1967, was when the first shooting started between the Black Panther Party and the Oakland Police Department. The first time there was any shooting, there was one policeman who was killed. The man who founded the Black Panther Party, Huey Newton, was arrested and charged with killing the policeman and with wounding one other policeman, and he himself was wounded in the shooting. And it was six months later that I was involved in a shooting incident this was two days after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and was really part of all of the uproar that took place in the aftermath of his shooting. In this shooting that I was involved in, three policemen were wounded and there were none of them killed. One member of our organization was killed. I was wounded along with one other member of the party. And I was taken and given some emergency medical treatment that night. After the treatment, I was taken directly to San Quentin Prison as a parole violator. When I look back at it, I figured that the best thing that happened to me that night was that I was taken to prison because the procedure that they used to take me to prison turned out to be an illegal procedure, technically illegal. And so I was able to get out of prison on a writ of habeas corpus a couple of months later and get out on bail. But at that time, we had a very militant governor in the state of California by the name of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and we used to call Ronald Reagan the father of the Black Panther Party because it started under his administration. And he took a very active role in my own case, and he was outraged that I was released on the writ of habeas corpus. And so they took it up to a higher court and the higher court agreed that I should be confined. And so they ordered me to report to San Quentin Prison in 60 days, which meant that I was free to remain at large in California, knowing that at the end of 60 days, I was supposed to go over and surrender to be taken to San Quentin Prison. But when they told me to show up in 60 days, I couldn't believe it. They said, do you understand that? I said, I certainly do. They say, will you be there? I said, I certainly will. But I, I had no intentions of being there, and I didn't think they really wanted me there if they were going to let me just walk out that way. And so during that 60 days, myself and some of my friends, we went to New York, and we had some discussions with the Cubans at the United Nations. They had been inviting us to come to Cuba for a long time. They had promised us that we could come there and organize a training facility where people could be taught how to use weapons, how to manipulate the different firearms, and also how to make different demolition devices such as uh, bombs, letter bombs, and so forth. There are many people at that time who were trying to make bombs, but they were blowing themselves up, blowing their mother's houses up, and so forth. So the Cubans offered us that if we would send someone to Cuba, we could organize this facility, and then they would show us how to do this in an expert way. Plus, we would be able to train our people in political and economic philosophy on the communist model. Well, up until my situation developed, we never had anybody in our organization who really wanted to go to Cuba and stay for any length of time. But when my situation developed, and after I had counsel with my friends, we decided that I would go on a little mission to Cuba. And so just a couple of days before I was supposed to surrender and be returned to San Quentin, I dropped out of sight and I made my way first to New York, then to Canada. And I had to wait in Canada for a couple of weeks for a boat. And then the boat came and I took the boat 
to Havana, and I arrived in Havana, Cuba, early Christmas morning of 1968. Well, when I arrived in Cuba, I was very happy to be there because it was the closest communist country to the United States. We used to refer to Cuba at that time as the first free, liberated territory in the Americas. And so when I stepped off that boat and touched down on Cuban soil, I was very pleased with myself. I was happy to be in Cuba, and I was proud that I had eluded the long arm of the law. And I felt that a completely new phase of my life was now opening up, and my intention was to learn how to be a good communist, a good revolutionary, a good Marxist-Leninist towards the day that I would come back to the United States of America and participate in the revolutionary struggle that we felt absolutely convinced was on the horizon and that was going to take place. Well, when I first went to Cuba, the Cubans began to hustle me all around the island. They took me on perpetual tours of the island. I wanted to go to work right away. I wanted to see the facility that they had planned for us, and I wanted to send word back to my friends to make their way to Cuba so that we could get down to business. Well, the Cubans felt that it was necessary for me to really learn about Cuba, and so they started taking me on all of these tours. They gave me a big case full of rum and another case full of Cuban cigars, and they gave me a couple of policemen who knew how to drink that rum. And so they were my companions, and they were really trying to get me to have that habit of just down in this rum. I didn't realize it at first, but after some time went by, I understood that the Cubans really didn't have any intention at all of giving us the facility that had been promised in New York. I began to see that in New York, they were making promises to everybody because what they were really trying to do was influence the anti-war movement into taking a pro-Cuban line against the American government. And so they were promising everybody everything. And so it's one thing to get a promise from a Cuban in New York, and another thing to go to Havana and try to get him to fulfill that promise. And so what they had a plan for me was keeping me occupied and keeping me loaded on this Cuban rum. Well, at a certain point, I told them that I was not going to go on any more of these tours, that I think that I had seen everything there was to see on the island that I was interested in, and I wanted to get down to work. And it was at that time that they told me that they had no intention at all of allowing us to have that facility. And really, the main reason that they were so leery about that had nothing at all to do with America. It had to do with Cuba and the very uh, tinderbox situation that existed in Cuba in terms of race relations. One of the things that had attracted us to Cuba was that the Cuban propaganda stated that under communism, all racial antagonism had ceased to exist and that all of the Cuban people were equal and that the future was bright. Well, my investigations of Cuba showed me that just the opposite was true, that they had mounted a very effective facade of equality and brotherhood and so forth, but behind the scenes, they were dealing with racial problems and racial attitudes that I had never experienced in my own life, that you'd have to go far back in American history to find a comparable situation as that that I encountered when I went to Cuba. In short, I began to uh, take another look and began to ask questions of what was going on in Cuba. And I found that as long as I was talking to members of the Communist Party, members of the government, or members of the military, that I would always get a very glowing picture about what was going on in Cuba. But as soon as I started talking to the common people, I began to get an opposite picture of what was going on. And I can just sum it up in a statement that a lady made to me one day. She said that if the borders were open and they allowed free travel in Cuba, there would be nobody left on that island except Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, and Juan Alameda. And I thought that these were scandalous statements when I first started hearing them from the common people. But after I stayed there for a while, I began to see 
behind the facade, and I began to see that there was a new kind of ruling class in Cuba, that the Communist Party constituted a new form of aristocracy, that they had privileges and access to goods and services which the other people didn't have any uh, opportunity to receive or participate in. And I began to see that the lie that communism tells about the beauty of life under communism was so totally spread that it was impossible to organize against it. In Cuba, you had people still hiding out in the mountains who were afraid to come down because the Cuban government would have taken them and put them in prison. I resisted this information at first, but after a while, I began to see that it was really true. And I began to say that maybe communism in Cuba is not working because it's so close to the United States of America, being only 90 miles away from Florida. I thought maybe there was some kind of evil wind blowing out of Florida, <laughs> blowing over that blessed isle and corrupting the efforts of the comrades there to establish a communist regime. Well, I got in contact with some airplane hijackers who had left America by rearranging some of the flight patterns here. <laughs> and Havana was full of hijackers at that time. And of course, I started inviting them to come to my house. And whenever they made it to my house, I would put them in the Black Panther Party, and then the Cubans would allow them to stay there. But they would try to catch them before they got to my house, and then they'd take them as far away as they possibly could and put them on those plantations cutting sugar cane and so forth. Well, this really wasn't what they had hijacked these planes going there hoping to find. Two of them I knew very well from San Quentin prison. And these two guys had worked their way down to a minimum security prison in, they call it Chino in Southern California. And they call it the country club of prisons because they have a swimming pool there and a golf course. And people are allowed to wear their own civilian clothing. Well, these two guys had arranged for some people on the outside to purchase them some plane tickets to New York, and they brought them some dynamite, some pistols, and some airplane tickets, and some more civilian clothing. If these guys jumped over the fence from the prison, got into this automobile, and went straight to the airport. They got on a plane, hijacked the plane to Havana, Cuba, and they got off the plane, and they were put directly into prison. Well, when I saw these two guys, one of them had completely lost his mind. He had lost his ability to make decisions. He didn't want to make any more decisions. He said that after making the decision to hijack a plane from a minimum security prison to a maximum security prison, <laughs> that he didn't trust his judgment anymore. So if you would ask him, hey, you want to go for a walk? He said, oh, it's up to you guys. Whatever you want to do, I'll do it, you know? Well, it was a, a surprising experience, is what I'm trying to underline in going to Cuba. And I felt that, well, I'm sure that communism is different in other parts of the world. So I made arrangements to leave Cuba and go to Algeria. And I went to Algeria because Algeria was the center for all of the revolutionary movements around the world. They were all welcome there, and they were all uh, allowed to function there. And when I went to Algeria, I was told that I was going to meet my wife in this certain hotel, in this certain room. And I went there, and I hadn't seen my wife for eight months, and I was sure that it was eight months, although I wasn't really marking it off on the calendar, but I could prove that it was eight months, because when I went to this hotel room and knocked on the door, the door was opened by a rather fat lady. And my wife is a thin lady. But this fat lady had my wife's head on her shoulders. <laughs> and I said, my goodness, Kathleen, baby, what happened? <laughs> and she says, um, what do you mean, what happened? <laughs> Don't you remember as you were leaving, I told you that perhaps we were expecting? I said, well, you know, we were always talking about expecting. She said, well, we are expecting. <laughs> and we're going to have a baby next month. I said, next month? When did I leave? January, February, March, April, May, June. I kind of crossed my fingers and sure enough, the next month, a baby was born, a little boy. I rushed to the hospital, look at this little boy. I want to make sure he looked just like me. <laughs> 
I looked at him. I thought maybe he'd have a little lightweight mustache or something. <laughs> Nothing. His face looked like a little crumpled up dish rag. <laughs> some of my friends, some of my friends looked at him and said, man, he looks just like you. <laughs> and my mother says it's me all over again. And he does look like me, and so there he is, almost 12 years old. So I'm able to say that I stayed in Cuba for eight months, no more and no less, arriving in Algeria just in time to greet the birth of my son, who was my first child. Well, that was in 1968, nine. <laughs> and we stayed in Algeria for the next four years. The following year, we had our daughter born on a trip that we made to North Korea. And it was during this four years that I had a chance to travel all over the communist world, all over the Arab countries in Northern Africa, and all over black Africa. And the only countries that I would avoid were the countries that I was afraid would arrest me and turn me over to the American government. So I avoided the countries that had friendly relationships with the United States, and I would feel most comfortable in the countries that were most hostile to the United States. And when I would go to these countries, I would go there to study or to participate in a conference, to make a speech denouncing the United States for the war in Vietnam or for the uh, situation of black people and other minorities in the United States. And I found that when I would go to these conferences, I'd hear other people talking about the conditions inside of their own countries. And I used to try very hard, being a very competitive person, to really put as much scorn and denunciation on the United States as I possibly could. But no matter what I said, when I would listen to these other people talking about their countries, I found it was impossible to top what they were saying about the deplorable conditions existing inside of their countries. So this was the way that my education took place. Not pursuing a positive attitude towards the United States, but really in pursuing a negative attitude towards the United States and trying to master information that would make me into that great communist, that great revolutionary that I wanted to be. But I would find out more and more about communism. I would find out who was in prison, who was in jail, and why they were in jail. I would find out how the government treated the people and how the people felt about the government. And the more I, the more I saw about what was going on in these communist countries, the more I understood that it wasn't just in Cuba that things had gone wrong, but things were wrong in every one of those countries. And I found that it was routine in those countries that people were tortured if they disagreed with the government. The communists define what they have established as normal. And anyone who deviates from that is defined by them as abnormal. And so they're sent to mental institutions to have their thinking corrected. And there are many people who receive shock treatments that have their whole brain blown away. People had surgical operations to remove part of their brain, the part that was causing the trouble. <laughs> People had injections of chemicals into their system to alter their nervous system. And of course, when I found out about that, at first, I would try to accept it by uh, using the rationalizations that the, Cubans, uh, that the communists give that they were doing this to the enemies of the people, that they were doing this to the enemies of communism. But the closer I looked, the more I saw that they were doing this to students. They were doing it to their writers. I found a situation in North Korea where the dictator decided that he needed a new crop of writers. And so he took all of the old writers and killed them, just stood them up against the wall and shot them. Well, as a writer, I could not agree with that. <laughs> I took it very personal. And it was my way, you know, because a lot of times we can see things happening around us and we can be blind to it. We can be so caught up in what we're doing that we don't even really see what has taken place. But when something strikes you in a personal way or in some way that you can relate to, then that's when you get your particular revelation on what happened. And so this made me start asking questions in a larger sense. This made me start wondering uh, just how legitimate it is for a government to execute or to tamper with the mentality of people 
who don't agree with them. And I started off in a frame of mind when I would have been very enthusiastic about uh, executing my enemies or burning them up, or if I could have got Richard Nixon and gave him some shock treatments, I think I would have done it at that time, the frame of mind that I was in. But you cannot take this kind of information in over and over again over a period of years without beginning to develop a picture of what's going on in the world. I began to see that people all over the world were struggling to get rid of military dictatorships, of one-party dictatorships, and of Communist Party dictatorships. And I began to see that people were struggling for democracy all over the world, that they wanted some channels to have some input into the decision-making process. And one thing I noticed about these communist countries is that the people seemed to have a certain attitude that I remembered from prison. This attitude in prison, I knew where it came from. It came from the fact that we had a warden who was like the dictator over the whole prison society. Beneath the warden, there was a prison staff that was beholden to the warden and that had absolute power over the population and that the population was a captive population that really didn't have anything to say about what was going on. And this engendered a certain spirit of oppression that was visible and that you could see in the attitude, you could see it in the facial expressions. And when I got to these communist countries and began to see the same spirit in the people, at first I tried to say, well, this is just their culture and so forth. But after a while, I began to admit to myself that it was because of the dynamics of the society, that the same dynamics that were present in prison are present in the communist societies where you have a man at the top similar to a warden who's a dictator. He might be called the president or the premier or the chief. It doesn't matter what they call him. It's his function that's important. And beneath him, he has a staff that is very similar to in relationship to that in any prison. And beneath that staff, there is that same captive population. And so the result, the dynamics are absolutely the same. Well, after seeing this all over the communist world, and I saw this from the Soviet Union, North Korea, China, North Vietnam, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany. It was the same spirit in every one of those countries with a little slight local variation. And then I saw the same thing throughout the third world where the people had patterned their dictatorships after these dictatorships in these Eastern communist countries. And I began to see that my whole attitude and my whole philosophy had to be re-examined. I began to reread the books and to rethink the propositions involved, and I understood that the whole thing went wrong the minute you established a dictatorship and confiscated all of the property and everybody had to go to work for the government. As soon as that happened, then the rest of it was inevitable, and I began to see that. Well, as I knocked around the third world and the communist world, and I reached this point of understanding, I didn't go from being a communist to being a Democrat or one who was favorable towards democracy. I went from being a communist to being something like a mixed up bowl of spaghetti or a mixed up ball of yarn, just really confused and really not knowing what to do about my confusion. I reached the point where I began to miss the Oakland Police Department. <laughs> now, you know there had to be a lot of water under the bridge before I reached that point. But I reached that point after watching the police functioning around the world. And I, sometimes I regret making these remarks because people misunderstand. Nothing that I'm saying is meant to sweep anything under the rug. I'm not trying to uh, apologize for any of the behavior of the police that is excessive. I think that the worst thing in the world is a crooked policeman or a policeman that violates his oath of office or his duty. But I've reached the point, <laughs> but I've reached the point where I think that the best thing in the world is a good policeman who does not violate his oath of office, and who fulfills his duty to the, to the uh, public. But I had a chance to contrast the police that I knew in America 
with the Algerian police, with the Czechoslovakian police. And I'm telling you, I had all of my experience with the police in America topped by what I experienced and observed in these other countries. For instance, the thing that I used to resent the most about American police was, in my own personal experience, was one time the police in San Francisco kicked my door down because I wouldn't unlock it. They came to my door and they knocked on the door and they said, I opened it up, I had one of these chains on the door and I opened the door to the chain and I said, well, what do you want? They said, we want to come in and search it. I said, well, do you have a warrant, a search warrant or an arrest warrant? And the policeman opened his coat up and he showed me a big Army 45. He said, this is my warrant. I said, that's not a warrant, and you're not coming in here unless you have a warrant. He said, open the door, I'm going to kick it down. I said, well, start kicking. Boom, boom. <laughs> he kicked my door in. Well, I always regretted that and I resented that and I always would mention that. But I had an experience in Algeria where I had to kind of forget that. Because over there, the police came through the wall <laughs> in a little tank, you know? You see? So it's, it's out of that kind of an experience that you can begin to appreciate uh, the kind of professional standards that the police do have in this country, where we have a constitution, a bill of rights, and some codes that are supposed to govern our behavior. Well, in looking around these other countries, they never heard of these kinds of rights. You wouldn't dare ask a policeman for a search warrant, and he never heard of a search warrant. And all these things that we take for granted, due process of law, the presumption of innocent until proven guilty. Over there, it's not even a question of whether or not you're presumed to be innocent or guilty. It's whatever it is, is expedient. For instance, someone over in this crowd right here might do something. And we don't know exactly who did it. So we say, I think, I'm pretty sure it happened right over here. So let's take all of these right here just to make sure. No warrant, we just take them and shoot them. And we don't publicize it, we just liquidate them in the name of the revolution. Well, after taking in a lot of this, because see, I didn't just change overnight. A lot of people look at me and say, Eldridge, one day you were a communist going this way, and now, boom, you flipped over, and now you're going this way, running around with Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it did not happen overnight, and I resisted this information every step of the way. But by being presented with an abundance of information, I could no longer deny the evidence that was placed before me. And that's when I began to uh, back away from the Marxist philosophy and began to admit and understand that democracy was where it is really at. Well, after having that experience on a political and economic level, I was having another experience at home where my two children were getting a little older. And at first, it wasn't much that I could do with them, you know, but just goo-goo them a little bit now and then or hold them on my knee like any proud father would do. I changed a few diapers now and then. I didn't want it to be said later on that I never changed my son's diaper or I never changed my daughter's diaper. And so I, I did manage to do that a few times just so the record would be clear on that point. <laughs> But I did not really take off in fascination with these children until they got a little older and started walking around and talking and calling me dad, dad, and so forth. And I remember one day in Algeria looking at my son and looking at my daughter and just something just snapped for me. And just looking at them, I used to call them little walking miracles. And I just realized that there was no way that these children could have come about by accident. The communists teach that life is an accident, that it has no purpose, it has no origin, it has no goal. When I looked at these children, I could see a combination of my wife's features and my features in their faces. When I looked at my little daughter, I could see that she inherited these cleaver ears. See, these ears just didn't happen. I inherited these ears. And when I looked at my daughter, I could see that she got a very heavy dose of these ears. <laughs> because hers come kind of straight out and if you look at her long enough, you'll get an optical illusion that they'll even wave at you, you know? <laughs> and I remember one day, 
I remember one day, my two children, and she doesn't like to hear me say this, but I, I'll clean it up for you, Joju. <laughs> we were walking up a hill in San Francisco, the four of us, and there was a drunk man coming down the hill with a lady, and he stopped dead in his tracks, and he pointed at my daughter and said, hey, there's Mickey Mouse, <laughs> talking about her ears. Well, we've had all kinds of discussions in my family about what do you do with ears, you know? And I've told my daughter that she doesn't have to worry that God has made a provision and that her head will continue to grow and catch up with her ears and she'll be balanced out someday. And don't worry about that, Joju, that'll happen. Well, when I saw those ears in Algeria and saw my features and my wife's features in her face and in my son's face, that's when I realized that there was a God out there somewhere. There had to be a God out there somewhere, that this was not an accident. These children were stamped from a, a mold, and that what I was looking at was really God's technology. The only problem I had was, what happened to that God? Did he create this universe and then gone on about his business? At first, I kind of hoped that he did, because I'd gone around cursing God, cursing religion, denouncing everybody who was involved in religion. I had believed that religion was a lie. I had gone around saying that I was an atheist. And here suddenly I realized that there was a God out there. I realized that I was in a world of trouble if that God was here monitoring this situation. <laughs> well, out the window went the old communist belief that I used to function on. You know, the communists teach that life is this accident. They say that the basic condition of the universe was a situation of matter in motion. And these molecules of matter were swirling around in this empty void, and somehow they collided and created a big spark. The spark went down and hit a rock. A lizard crawled out from under the rock, and that's your grandfather, see? <laughs> huh? Well, it seemed to me that the that the situation was much more marvelous and much more complex than that. And I began to understand why the communists go to great lengths to say that there is no God. If you recall, in the very first line of the Declaration of Independence, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Well, the communists have to get God out of the picture in order to derive all of your rights from the state. The minute you put God in the picture, you complicate the whole situation. And so philosophically, they've arrived at a position that conveniently eliminates God from the entire picture. Well, I realized that when I was living in Algeria, after I realized that there was a God out there, and I began my search for a relationship with that God. And I found that relationship at the end of that whole process. I came face to face with the reality of Jesus Christ. I fell out on my knees with tears in my eyes and acknowledged that reality. And that began the process of me turning my life over to Jesus Christ. And that was the beginning of my return to America. At the end of that process, we left Algeria. We went to live in France. And it was there that I came face to face with that awesome reality. At first, I thought that I was going crazy. And all of my friends were convinced that I was going crazy because I had started talking against communism. I started talking America up, and I started talking about Jesus Christ. And so all of my friends started looking at me askance and wondering what would I come up with next, and what would I say next? Well, the next thing that I said was that I was going home, and that I was going to surrender to the authorities and come back and face whatever music was in store for me and get my life straightened out. And I did that. As soon as I told these lawyers, they thought I was drunk. They thought I was on some kind of a drug. Or they thought that the CIA had put pressure on me 
That's what everybody seemed to think that when I made that decision, I had either made a deal with the FBI or the CIA or somebody. They couldn't believe that I had a change of heart and that I wanted to come back home because I was homesick and that I was tired of knocking around the third world and the communist world and that I felt that communism was wrong and that democracy was right. Well, the American authorities also thought that something underhanded was going on. When my lawyer contacted the American embassy and told them that I wanted to surrender and come back, they said, what is he up to now? They said, ah, oh, he's trying to get his hands on a passport, on an American passport, because they never issued me one. But I didn't need them to issue me a passport. I had a whole box full of passports. <laughs> I had traveled all over the world several times without having one of their passports. As a matter of fact, we had developed a little procedure where we were issuing our own passports. We were doctoring American passports and passports from any country. I had a passport in my little survival kit from every country in the world where it was feasible for a person of my complexion to be from. I mean, I didn't have a Swedish passport, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, at every step of the way, I have met people who refused to believe that I had had a change in my life, people who thought that I was involved in some kind of insidious plot, many people who want to block me outside of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, many people who believe that the only reason that I go around saying what I'm saying is because I'm trying to influence the judge so that he would do something favorable in court. My old friends were convinced that I had become an FBI agent. And I used to go around telling people, I, I, I'm not an FBI agent. I don't even know any FBI agents. But after meeting Dr. Scowls, and I can't say that anymore, all right? <laughs> and so I finally reached the point where I don't care about that anymore. And I'm able to say that, yes, I sold out in returning to the United States. I sold out to America, and I sold out to Jesus Christ, because I saw where I was coming from. I have judged my past behavior. I'm not proud of it. I've gotten on my knees, and I've asked God to forgive me. And I've taken off on the path of repentance. And I started studying the Holy Scripture, and I'm not deceived because I realize that none of us are perfect, that we all have our own cross to bear, that we all have our own different past to deal with, and that we've all made different mistakes in the past. And the main thing is to reach a point to where you break with your past behavior and begin to live a life that is acceptable to God and acceptable to your fellow human being. And I think that that's all I can do. <laughs> now we stand now at a very perilous time in world history. We stand now some 120 years after the moment when President Abraham Lincoln stood and asked the question of whether it was possible for a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal could long endure. We have endured some 120 years beyond the point where he asked that question. And now another question is before us because we are now confronted with the most awesome challenge that we've ever been confronted with in the whole history of this country. We are confronted with a new form of government, a new form of civilization that condemns democracy, that condemns our capitalistic economic system, and that fully intends to bury us and fully intends to take over the entire world. Now, I saw for myself that the United States of America occupies the bullseye on the communist target. 
The United States of America is the only obstacle in the path of communism from taking complete control of the entire world. And that's what's at stake. The control of the entire world is what's at stake in the confrontation that we now have with communism. Well, I believe that it is possible for the United States of America not only to endure, but to triumph over communism because communism has already been exposed as a government that is lacking in the ability to deliver the good life of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the people. The people in communist countries have already judged that system. We can see this very clearly from what's going on in Poland right now. But I'm saying to you that the same thing that's going on in Poland exists in every single communist country on the face of this planet and in every single third world country where they have these one-party dictatorships. The cry and the demand of the people of the world is for democracy. Now we should be happy about that and that should be encouraging to us. There was a time when we were very happy to be exporting democracy to the rest of the world. When you look back historically, you will see that when the United States of America came into being, there was not one single democratic country in the whole world, not one. The United States was the very first democratic country in the world. After it came into being, it had an impact on the world that began to transform the whole world in its image. We used to be proud of that. Now we're kind of ashamed to say that we want the whole world to be like us. Well, when I was traveling around the world, people used to say, we don't want to become like America. We don't want the whole world to become one big McDonald, <laughs> or one big supermarket. And those are some of the aspects of our cultural life that they might not be so enthusiastic about. But everywhere in the world, people are enthusiastic about democracy. And we need to get enthusiastic about it again and stop being ashamed to say, yes, we do want to transform the whole world in our political image because there is not one single alternative. There is no alternative to democracy except one form of oppression or another. Democracy is the supreme form of government that has existed on this planet Earth. And we should be proud of that. We should be able to say, we should be able to say that we want the whole world to be democratic, not just in Latin America, not just in Africa. We want democracy taken also into those countries that are now dominated by communism. We want the Soviet Union to become democratic. We want China to become democratic. We want North Korea to become democratic. And we want Cuba to become democratic. And we should insist on that. I believe that we are going to have to start asserting more influence and more control over the world because somebody has to make decisions about what kind of world we're going to have. As it is right now, we are trapped in a situation where the United Nation is considered to be the maximum forum for deciding what the future is going to be. Well, I believe that we need to reject the United Nations simply because, <laughs> simply because it has become a grab bag of ideologies and cultures and totalitarian values, feudalistic values, have too much impact on the decision-making process that is determining the shape of the world to come. We don't necessarily have to resign from the United Nations, but we need to put the United Nations in its place. We need to organize an alternative body that would consist of only the countries in the world that are dedicated to democracy. I'm not talking about a military alliance. I'm not talking about a military alliance such as we have in NATO, but I'm talking about something like a World Council of Democratic Nations, where only the countries that really practice and believe in democracy can be members, and that way we can hold up an image to the world where they can see a choice between democracy and totalitarian values. Because what happens in the United Nations, everything gets lost and confused Everybody has the same kind of vote. Everybody gets up and makes speeches. But we need to have a forum where communists and other totalitarian forces are not welcome.
We need to have the attitude that we are now setting out on the task of completing the American Revolution. The American Revolution came into being with the determination to spread democracy to the entire world. Well, we spread it all over the world, but it will not be complete until we spread it to the entire world. And we cannot consider the American Revolution terminated until that has happened, and until the whole world enjoys its freedom and democracy. We see a situation right now where France has become a socialist country. This is going to present us with some very awesome challenges. What we need most of all in this country is for the American people to refresh their acquaintance with democracy, to refresh their acquaintance with the roots of this civilization. We have a country today that is full of American citizens, but there's not full of Americans who have drank deeply from the spirit of America as laid down by those who founded this country on the high hopes that they projected into the future. When you look back at history, you'll see that when America was established, we were not the freest country in the world. We had slavery on our own territory. We had all kinds of discrepancies between the upper classes and the lower classes. But we had something that no other country had. We had the will and the determination to project a higher standard than we had at that moment and then aspire to arise to that high standard. And we did that. We abolished slavery. Some people say, well, we abolished it too slow. Well, I say better late than never. And we did it in high style. And now we have a situation where the children of the slaves and the children of the slave masters are equal citizens under the same flag and under the same constitution. I say that we need to carry the process even farther. We need to get rid of some of these attitudes that we have. We have people walking around where they won't even look at each other with any kind of outgoing, happy look on their face. It's characteristic that certain people from minority groups, when they look at white people, they have a frown on their face. White people look at them and they have a frown on their face. Well, I say all of us need to have our faces washed. And we need to do that. We are not a country that's ready to roll over and play dead. We're not a country that's ready to step aside to make way for the hobnail boots. We're a country that is capable of rising above itself. And now we're challenged again. And my determination is to work to see to it that we develop in this country a very firm new consensus to maintain the stability of our democratic political institutions. We have a big argument on our hands over economic policy. Every president who goes to Washington has his own economic policy. We can afford to discuss, to negotiate, and argue over economics, but we must draw a firm line when it comes to our political institutions and say that we are not going to allow them to be subverted from within and we're not going to allow them to be overthrown from without. We draw a line at that point. And therefore, I am very happy, very proud to be here in Provo, Utah, where the spirit of 76 has never died, where the people are able to put on a festival of freedom like you're doing here now, where in other parts of this country, you have to argue with the mayor if you want to organize a 4th of July celebration such as we've been doing in San Jose, California. But we need the kind of spirit that says that we're going to have our 4th of July celebration even if the mayor and all the other politicians boycott it and don't want it to have anything to do with it. Because this country was not made up of mayors and politicians. It's made up of little people like you and me. It's the little people of this country that has made it great and it's going to continue to be that way. We need to become invigorated, we need to become enthusiastic, and we need to become proud once again from top to bottom, assured that this great country that was inspired by God Almighty who guided the pilgrims to these shores and who guided us through 500 years of bitterness and strife and brought us to this point where we are today. I want to say this. 
We need people to start looking forward. We need to close the book on the past. We need black people to stop looking back at slavery and start looking at the day and looking to the future. We need Indians to stop looking back at the things that have happened to them in their past. We need the Chicanos to stop looking back into the past. And we need the white people to stop looking back into the past. We need to join hands as brothers and sisters under one banner and stand shoulder to shoulder and march on to the great future that is in store for this nation. And we don't need to... <laughs> we need to understand. We need to understand that there is a difference between birth pains and death throes. A lot of times we look around at what's going on in America and we say America is dying, that these are death throes that we are witnessing. Well, when we look back, we have seen that America has had a new burst of freedom over and over again. And we're at a point now where we need a new birth of freedom. And so let's look upon what's happening now in the country as birth pains and not death throes. And we're going to make it. Not only are we going to make it, but we're going to lead the whole world into a whole new era of freedom, democracy, and plenty. We have the tools to do it. We have the people to do it. We have the history to inform us on how to do it. And we have the will to do it. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for being so patient. I want to thank my host for not dragging me away from this podium for going over time. But it's really a great pleasure to be here in Provo, Utah, where people still love America and still love freedom and knowing that this spirit is going to go throughout this land. We need a spiritual revival in this country, and we need a political revival in this country. And we can't make it without one or the other. They both go hand in hand. If we truly believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who taught us to love one another, if we love one another, we cannot rip each other off. When you love someone, you, you go out of your way to see to it that that someone has the very best that life has to offer. So we need to extend our love beyond our own family, beyond our own town, beyond our own state, to embrace all of God's children on God's terms. Not on our terms, but on God's terms as laid down in his holy scripture. And I know that we are going to rise to that occasion and make this a reality. So it's in that spirit that I have come here, and it's in that spirit that I will leave here with an enthusiasm to go anywhere at any time to stand up for America because it is truly worth standing up for. God bless each and every one of you as you go from here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>